This is Beyond with Heather Tesh, where we examine near-death experiences and life itself, hopefully making this life a little better. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much to Heidi Barr. Hello, Heidi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Oh, I really am enjoying our conversation. (laughs) For those of you that are just tuning in now, in part one, Heidi talked about her near-death experience, and boy, um, did she have an incredible one where she met Jesus, she met God, um, so many factors, did some really fun things Mm -hmm. um, when she was in this (laughs) heavenly space. So I'll have a link to that in the description, but you can also stay right here and then go back to that later because we're going to talk about some of these things in a bit more detail. Heidi, one thing you said in your book, and you were talking about this really fun experience, first of all, in our last Uh segment about where you were surfing on a wave. And in your book, you said something like, Jesus seems like the kind of guy that you'd want to have a beer with. Oh, absolutely. He's fun. He's hilarious. He jokes. He laughs. He loves life. He probably loves life more than any human being alive. He's, he's just great. He's your best friend, best guy to be with in the world. I have heard that from other people that have met him in a near-death experience. And then also, heaven sounds like a blast as well. Heaven was beautiful, at least what I could see of it. I didn't get the full tour. I know some people get to see a city or a gate or something. I, I saw probably what meant so much to me was nature. I love nature. I spent, you know, my childhood was mixed, but in some ways it was idyllic. We lived right across the street from this big forest and I spent most of my childhood in the forest running barefoot. I love nature and God showed me the nature of heaven, which was absolutely amazing. I still, to this day, plant things in my yard that remind me of heaven. And uh, yeah, Jesus is just the most fun guy you could ever meet. Yes, he is relatable. He's approachable. And the sense I got, if this image, I think this image will make sense to people. Jesus is like God putting on skin and walking through through life. If you remember that, you you pro- a lot of people probably aren't old enough, but let your fingers do the walking through the yellow pages, that ad, where some hand put a glove on and walked through the yellow pages. There was just a disembodied hand with a glove on walking through the yellow pages. That's what it struck me as Jesus was God putting on skin and walking through life with us. This is... Because otherwise, God, God is approachable, but he's still kind of unfathomable, fathomable. Jesus is, much, Jesus is like us. He's uh, a lot bigger than us. He's a lot greater than us, but he's still like us. So we can relate to him and he can relate to us in very human terms. It's, I don't, I think we would um, be, be pretty overwhelmed by God, if he were to show up, it would, I don't, I don't know that we would survive truly if God were to show up. It's kind of like Mount Sinai where he was very incredibly powerful and obscured by clouds mostly. And yet what's interesting that you and other near-death experiencers have challenged God, have challenged Jesus, and and you did not want (laughs) to go back. And I I find that also Uh -uh. refreshing that, you know, we can sometimes, I guess, push back. I mean, not that we're going to win, but it's okay to do that. Yeah. He, he didn't seem surprised. I didn't, I really didn't want to come back. He didn't seem surprised, but he wasn't going to let me stay there. And I, I wasn't entirely sure. I kind of thought I was supposed to die, but God changed his mind. That was my sense that I was really supposed to stay there. I really did not want to go back, but I, I felt like, uh, I had I'd made a promise to God when I was a kid that I would not do to my children what my parents were doing to me. And I kind of felt like he was giving me the opportunity to keep that promise. And I, I did keep it. So, yes, I, I think God 
all through the Bible, God remembers his promises to Israel. And I think God remembered my promise. It's sort of in existential terms and spiritual terms. But yeah, he sent me back and um, totally changed my outlook on life. I never, I was, became immediately, the minute I woke up, even though I was really severely injured and I was in shock, I was very engaged in life. And, uh, and I've never been disengaged since. So life is really important to me. And it's, I somehow ended up, believe me, I didn't, I didn't become a nurse because all my life I'd wanted to be a nurse that had nothing to do with it. I, that was, that's God in the machine. And I, I like, cause I still don't even like the sight of blood, <laughs> but you know, I became a, an intensive care nurse, cardiac care nurse, and then went into hospice and loved it. Heidi, a lot of people want to hear what Jesus looks like. So can you describe him to us? I can. I can describe what he, I can describe what I saw. He's 5'9", 5'10", maybe, slender, has beautiful hands, beautiful feet. I He was wearing kind of a, this robe and I didn't see his wrists, didn't see his ankles, but I saw his feet and I noticed he had long toes. I have long toes and I thought he has long toes like me. He had a beard. It wasn't long, but he, you know, like kind of like a beard like my husband has. I could, he had whiskers, mustache. Um, his hair was about this length and it was more of a chestnut brown and wavy with some lighter streaks. He had a broken nose, which just struck me as interesting. I was stared at his nose and I was fascinated because it was kind of pushed to the left slightly. And at the time when I was staring at his nose, I didn't know from anything I'd ever heard. I didn't know about his beatings before he was crucified. I didn't know he had brothers. I didn't know he had a family. And I just looked at him and thought, oh, one of maybe one of his brothers punched him in the nose when he was a kid <laughs> because it looked like someone had broken his nose. He had um, the most beautiful eyes. They were, when he laughed, they crinkled in the corners and turned up at the corners. And this was something I didn't want to tell anyone for a long time, but he had blue eyes. He had the most brilliant blue eyes I've ever seen. And I could not look away from his eyes because they were so filled with joy. It was uh, high cheekbones, um, just a beautiful face. It, you would have called him a handsome man, but he, he just, he just had a beautiful face and his face would have been beautiful regardless of whether he was handsome by our standards or not. But the, the most important thing was, I, there was so much joy and love coming from his face and his eyes that I didn't want to look away from his face. And it was when we were traveling, I missed a lot of stuff because what I saw was what I saw fl flashing behind him. I was staring at his face the whole time, most of the time. And so I, if I saw things, I saw them as we were flying by them because I was, I was looking at his face. So I was looking at things over his shoulders and, um, man, gorgeous smile, just a smile that just makes you fall in love with him. He truly is love incarnate. That's the best way I can describe him. It's a beautiful man. You also, of course, met God. You sat on his lap. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting to me because at first you saw the light, you felt the love. So is God both a person and also this energy? I think God can be whatever he wants to be. I once read a book about um, the power of God stored in a basement. And someone said, how can, how can you keep God in a box in your basement? And, and the other character said, well, if God chooses to be in a box in a basement, he can be in a box in a basement. He, God is a whole lot of things that we will never understand. And yes, he was light and he was love. It's li a living light. But he was also had a human form. I literally was sitting on his lap like a child sitting on her father's lap. So yes, he had a lap and he had his arms around me. 
And I could feel that and the, the warmth and the love and the acceptance coming from God is, is beyond compare. It's, it's just, it's, you can't come up with enough words to express that love, that feeling of love and acceptance and belonging. But I, as I said, I, I couldn't see his face. And I kind of figured, okay, that's probably a good thing. So I think God can be a whole lot of things, but he's not just one. He's, he's, he's not, you can't pin him down. He's not one or the other. He's all those things at once. Hard to explain, I know, but he is all those things at once. I think we often try to put human characteristics on God. And you mm -hmm. just said, you know, God is so much bigger than we can imagine. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that a little bit? He's, well, God is beyond, God is beyond my understanding. Even Jesus is, although Jesus is more relatable because Jesus looks like us and totally. But if he, if he wants to, I suppose, but think of, you have to think of something that always existed, that was pre-existent, that has all of the knowledge and the power in the universe that's everywhere at all, everywhere all the time, that's beyond time and space. Because I did get that sense that wherever I was, wherever I was, it was beyond time and space. There, it was somewhere else. But at the same time, it's here on earth too. We're, it's, it's everywhere in the universe. God permeates everything. He's everything in the universe. It's so hard to explain. <laughs> I loved a line in your book because you said the immensity of God will bring us to our knees. It's true. I, he's a really loving father and I got that sense. But I think if I was to actually, if God was to actually manifest on earth as he did, for the ancient Israelites on Mount Sinai, I think we would be overwhelmed. I don't think humans are meant to truly experience that kind of power, at least not in as we are currently formed. That kind of power is, it would be actually scary. And I think we should, I mean, awesome in the sense of being in awe of that kind of power. And there were lots of ins episodes in the Hebrew Bible where people were killed by that power. So, you know, people accidentally who approached, say, the ark were, were killed by that power. I don't know what it is. I, I, I know when I was dead, everything made sense. I didn't have any more questions. Why are we here? What is the purpose of life? What happens after death? I didn't have any more of those questions. They were all answered immediately. I totally understood everything. When I came back, I didn't understand. I, I knew that I, I remembered that I had known the answers, but that's it. I didn't remember the answers. I didn't remember the explanations. Did you remember feeling satisfied by the answers, even though you couldn't remember them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember feeling, oh, this totally makes sense. This makes complete sense. I don't, I, I understand. I don't have to worry about this. But when you come back to life, and it made sense to me that we, we shouldn't have that information. If we had that information, what would, what would we do with it here? We were here to live this life and learn and seek people, seek God, figure things out. So if we already had it figured out, we'd just like kick back, eat popcorn and watch TV. And that would be really boring <laughs> and a waste of time. One thing I find interesting is so often there's such a duality of like a couple things almost are true at the same time. And um, in your book, you talked about God being everywhere, but you also said this, which I thought was really interesting. So I'm going to have you explain what this means. Okay. You said you realized as you reached a threshold that all things became God. Yes, I realized that. But at the same time, Jesus and I were still individuals. But everything was one thing. And that one thing was God. But at the same time, 
there was individuation within that one thing. And this is what's so hard to explain. I realized that God is everywhere in everything. There is no place in this universe or wherever, infinity, where he is not. But I mean, that was just, it was such a big thing to realize. And I, I, I can't explain it better other than that sentence. I realized, and I'll, I'll have to say it in the negative again, there is no place in this, in this universe or in our lives where God is not. He's everywhere, all the time, in everything. And that's about the best explanation I can give it. If you if you have a more directed question, I'll try to answer that. But it, I understand even the questions are hard to come up with a, a question about this. Well, I think what's comforting too in what you said is a lot of people feel alone. Mm -hmm. But I think they have to remember that even when they can't feel God, that doesn't mean God isn't there. Absolutely. He's always there. And there have been times in my life growing up where I felt alone. I felt terribly alone. And I felt... I knew he was there, but I felt like I, I turned from him because I didn't want him to see me. And he, you are never alone. I, uh, a lot of the patients I've taken care of have described their death visions or described, I had one person in particular describe to me what was happening as he died. Well, two actually, two who, who described what was happening as they were dying. And they had somewhat similar experiences to mine. They did die and stay dead. But yes, God was with them. At the end, God was with them. What did they say that they saw? Well, the first man, and this was when I was in coronary care, was dying, had barely a heartbeat. We tried coding him and didn't work, which I knew it wouldn't work. And he was talking to me after everyone cleared out of the room. And he said, I said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, I know how hard that was because he was still semi-conscious while we were coding him because his heartbeat was like seven beats a minute. And he said, it doesn't matter. I didn't feel it. I'm up at the ceiling watching you. He said that to me and I realized, okay, he's experiencing exactly what I experienced. And I said, well, at least I can do is send you to heaven clean. So I got all the gunk from the code off of him and just sat with him and held his hand until he died. I had another patient who had had a stroke and I was sitting at his bedside, his um, daughter, he was at his daughter's house and his daughter had had this big trip to Europe planned with her twin boys and the father was supposed to go, but he'd had a stroke. So we sent them off and I was waiting for his other daughter to arrive. And he suddenly sat up in bed and he said, can you see it? And he pointed at the wall at the bottom of his bed, at the foot of his bed. And I said, what do you see? And he said, that beautiful meadow, can you see it? And I said, no, I can't see it, but I, I believe you. And he said, the grass, it's so beautiful. And then he said, my wife, my wife is coming. She's coming out of the light. Can you see my wife? And I said, no, but I know she's there. And he said, I'm going home. I'm going home to God and I'm going home to my wife. And then he looked at me and he went, don't call my daughter. <laughs> and then he laid back and died. And he was just so sweet. And I ended up just resting my head against his. And I think we were both there for an hour before the other daughter got there. But, um, I didn't want to interrupt the trip. So I didn't interrupt the trip to Europe that she was taking with her twin sons. And it was just really remarkable. I've, I've experienced some very, some, so many remarkable deaths in hospice, so many beautiful people that that's why I say, I don't always know what's going on in someone's heart or soul. So I won't judge. God told me not to judge. I am not the judge, you know. I think that's really interesting too, because you weren't condoned by Jesus. You didn't feel judged. You felt like you judged yourself. Mm -hmm. Yet I do find here on earth, 
that there are a lot of people that tend to judge um, other people for their beliefs, thinking they're incorrect when maybe we all have to take our own path. I, I judge what's right and wrong for me based upon what I learned when I was dead. And yes, I do have, I'm not going to participate in something I think is wrong. And I try really, believe me, I am not perfect. I'm so not perfect. I am perfectly capable of getting mad. I'm capable of being impatient. I am capable of being really crabby, especially if I don't get enough sleep. I've yelled at my kids. So I'm not perfect, but I do judge. I do have a con, I have a pretty strong concept of right and wrong, but I try not to judge what's in someone else's heart and soul and what the right path is for them because that's between them and God. I can, if somebody asks me, as you're asking me, if somebody asks me questions about what happened to me, I'm more than happy to tell them what happened to me. And if they want to know more, I, I'm not a clergyman. I would direct them to a clergyman. They could read the Bible. They could read the New Testament, the Old Testament. But I, um, I try really hard and it's not always possible not to judge the heart and soul of another individual. And I also learned too, that there is evil in this world, a lot of evil in this world. Um, and I pray for that. I pray for those people too, who are caught up in that. Even, even those souls, God doesn't want anyone. He doesn't want to lose anyone to, to evil. He doesn't want people. That's, we're not supposed to be evil. I don't think he created us to be evil. That's just the way I see things. And so I, I pray for those people. And, you know, I pray, I think about, I think about what I do every day. I think about, okay, you could have done this better. I don't obsess about it, but we're never going to be perfect, but we can be better. That's just the way I look at it. I know in your book, you use the words that Jesus doesn't nag or scold. No, he doesn't. And I think that's really powerful because it teaches us, I think, how we should act. And like you were just saying, you know, prayer is a, a much more powerful thing that people can do. Mm -hmm. I, I've prayed my whole life. Even when I was a little kid, I would pray. Don't ask me how I knew about prayer. Maybe uh, a grandmother taught me about prayer. I don't really remember, but it seemed innate. It seemed easy to me. Prayer to me was like talking to God. And I, I pray every day. I view every action as a prayer. And sometimes my actions suck. Sometimes I'm, sometimes I am, you know, I'm not always the best person. I can, especially if my, if, for example, if you have ever had kids involved in sports, you will know that sometimes you don't agree with a coach and you might have an <laughs> yes. argument with a coach. I do that. I will do that. I'm very protective of my children. I'm, but part, and part of that is a reaction to the fact that my parents were not protective of me. So I'm quite protective of, of my children. But, um, yeah, I, in ultimately, I try really hard not to judge. We're going to see a lot of weird stuff in this world. The way I look at it is, and I think I put it, it's at the very end of the book. If you think, if I had a whiteboard, I would draw it. If you think of God's plan as being a circle, but it's an infinite circle. And every step we take, no matter what choices we make, are, with, are in God's plan. And the plan just shifts as we make our choices. But it's all still part of the plan. That's the sense I got when I was dead. We make our choices. We have free will. All of that free will is contained within the plan. So the plan shifts a little bit when we make choices. So we all have a plan for our life, but then within that plan, we can make our free will choices? Yes, that's what I see. We're, well, God has a bigger plan too, and we're all in that plan. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yes, we totally have free will within that plan. We make our choice. We make our own choices. Absolutely. In your life review, you said that you learned that everything we do and everything we say impacts those around us. Can you mm -hmm. expand on that a bit? Well, I had one episode that Jesus showed me because I really wasn't a terrible kid. I was a normal kid. And there, my father was driving a, another young man who was a few years older than me and myself to Hebrew school after school. And I was very tall for my age. He was very small for his age. And I just looked at him and I said, why are you so shrimpy? Now, I don't even know why I said that. And he just kind of curled up in the, a corner of the back seat of the car. And I knew he, I had hurt him. I knew in that moment I had hurt him. And I thought, uh, okay, yeah, but I won't say that again, but I'll just ignore it. But Jesus, Jesus showed me that. And he showed me how those words, my words impacted that young man, that they actually, I could feel his heart shrinking within his chest when I said those words. And I felt absolutely terrible. So I realized whatever we say, whatever we do affects the people around us. It, we can crush people with words. It's not just if somebody's punching someone, it's our words are, hurt, are hurtful as well. So um, I kind of, I'm never going to succeed entirely, but I try to watch, I try to be conscious of what I'm saying, how I'm relating to other people. And the other thing I learned, and this took me a while to learn, was to let people in. I'm very self-protective because of my past. I tended to build up a lot of walls and a lot of those walls evaporated because of Jesus with that near-death experience. A lot of those walls evaporated. And uh, at times I've had more walls because other bad things have happened, but they then I work through that, they evaporate. But, you know, everything, every single step we take in this earth does something, affects someone, affects some aspect of life. And I try to keep it as positive as possible. But, you know, I loved the fact that Jesus didn't nag and he didn't finger point. And he wasn't a nagging parent. He was just, I knew when I came back, I wanted to be what he wanted me to be. There was, there were just overnight, I stopped smoking. I stopped using drugs. I stopped hanging out with the kids I was hanging out with. It was, it was a no brainer. I woke up and I was like, okay, that's done. I'm never, never doing that again. I didn't even have to think about it. It was now part of me that I wanted to be what he wanted me to be. And it's been a process, but I'm hoping someday I'll get there. I'm still in process. Well, we have alluded to this with some of the things that we've said, um, but we haven't talked about the details of your childhood. And I want to recommend your book because not only is it an extremely detailed near-death experience and everything you saw and uh, the things that you went through and God and Jesus that you talked about. But it also is a really fascinating story of what your life was like before this experience and that transformation yeah. that you talked about. So it's called What I Saw in Heaven, and it really is um, an incredible book. So I appreciate you writing that. It, it really you. is you know, a gift to so many of us. Well, life isn't easy for anyone. Even if yeah. someone tells you their life is easy, I <laughs> don't know that they're telling the truth. Maybe they would like to believe it's easy. I experienced a lot as a child and, uh, and as an adult. And my relationship was very strained with my parents, but you, you learn in the book how we sort of resolve things at the end of their lives. It's, it's, it's really a tragedy in a sense that it had to take the end of their lives to resolve our conflicts, but it worked out the way it was supposed to work out. And uh, both my parents have, you know, they died within the, the past two years. And 
I'm fine, which is really remarkable. I feel like I feel like God was with me and it helped me immensely to get through a lot of stuff and to see that I don't have room for animosity. I don't have room for resentment. I don't have, I don't want to waste my time on that. And yeah, it was a struggle at times to deal with parents who were very self-focused. And, um, you know, my, my, Dad, I know um, John Burke and I've talked about this and, and he, my dad never lifted a, a hand to us and he could say, and with all honesty, I never lifted a hand. He, he didn't. What I experienced was different than that. It was, there was a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of spiritual abuse, just a lot of neglect. My sisters experienced some of that as well. We all had our own role to play in the family and I will never speak for them. But, um, I'm good. I'm fine. And I don't, I don't have regrets. I, I guess one of the things I learned is one of the things I learned through Jesus is I have, to, I have now, I have today. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. So I'm grateful for, for today. And that's what I learned about with death that we, Anything can happen to anybody at any time. We don't know. So I put my faith in him and go from there. And I think gratitude and that appreciation of just living in the now really is the key to living a happy life. Heidi, it's been so great to talk to you. If people want to get your book or you know find out more about you, where should they go? My book will be available on Amazon through Baker Books, uh, Barnes and Noble. I think almost any place that carries books will have hard copies, paperback copies, probably ebook copies are available as well. And, um, feel free. Buy it. It's just, it was an interesting book to write because I started writing it the day my dad went on hospice and I finished it shortly after his funeral, it, the words sort of poured out from me. And um, I read it. I would love whoever wants to read it, read it, just appreciate it for what it is and enjoy it. It's, it's a book of struggle. It's a book of reconciliation and it's a book about God. And I, I just want to thank anyone who buys the book and thank you for this. Heather, this is really, oh. really sweet of you to do this interview. Oh my gosh, this is so my mm -hmm. honor. I can't tell you how grateful I am to have heard your story, to read your book, and then to get the opportunity mm -hmm. to just dig into it more and ask you questions about it. It's, it's really a treat for me. And I know it's a treat for the viewers as well, who are really grateful to also hear your story. Thank you. Heidi, if you have or do you have any words of wisdom or any parting words that you would like to leave with the people that are listening right now? There's hope. That's what I learned. I grew up hopeless. I grew up feeling hopeless that there was no hope in life, that we were doomed to live this life, die and become nothing but dirt. There's hope. There's hope and faith and everything we want in God. Hope is probably the most important gift God can give us. And when I came back from the other side of death, I had hope. It makes a huge difference in my life. Thank you, Heidi. And you do write it right about that very beautifully. And again, I, I've so enjoyed your book. So I want everybody that is listening to know that. And Heidi, I just thank you again. Thank you so much for being here, being with me today and, and sharing your story with my audience. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. It's been great. Once again, I just have to say how much I enjoyed talking to Heidi. I found her to be fascinating. I loved all of the information that she shared, all of the detail in her extraordinary near-death experience. And for those of you that jumped in in part two and you haven't watched part one yet, 
I'll have a link to that in the description, but you really need to because it's just wild, all the stuff that went on during her near-death experience. But um, there were so many interesting things that she'd cover, that she did cover. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on some of the things that she said and experienced, what stood out to you the most. And if you'd rather just say, I made it, that's always nice to hear in the comments, just so I know that you made it through this episode all the way to the end. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you being here, watching my channel. It really does mean a lot to me. And also, you know, many, many thanks to all my great guests because I've just so enjoyed talking to people like Heidi and everybody else. So thank you again, everybody. And I hope I will catch you in the next episode. Thanks for joining me on Beyond with Heather Tesh. Please add comments and questions you'd like future guests to answer. Also, if you liked what you heard, please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe. That'll help keep this podcast going. You can also go to Beyond with Heather Tesh to look for more episodes.